for us talking about how muscles work. It's not, in chapter 10, we'll talk about how muscle, which muscles which, right? That's not gonna be on your lecture exam. That'll be on the lab practical, which muscle which. Nine is about how does a muscle work? How do I tell my brain to contract that muscle? We don't even think about it, right? When you walk, do you have to think about pushing off with your leg, right? Then you have to think about landing with your other leg. Now, when you're walking upstairs, with the first couple steps, you might, or maybe with the first couple steps, but can you imagine if you have to think about every muscle contraction, every step you take when you're jogging, right? If you're jogging for an hour, you'd be exhausted mentally if you have to actively think about every single muscle contraction. So we're gonna see that your brain can sometimes take over the machinery of contracting the muscles. The muscles itself are incredibly important in how the brain interacts with it. So it allows us to connect what happens with our brain and how it controls the muscle itself. So when we talk about the muscular system here, that's the main focus. How does a muscle contract? What happens physiologically when the muscles contract? How does the brain tell the muscles contract? So these are all different functions of the muscular system, movement of the body, all right? Obviously your skeletal muscles, maintenance of posture, respiration. Yeah, respiration for the most part is voluntary. You control if you hold your breath. You control when you take your next breath. Now, there is a little bit of a, a vague line where, you know, if you hold your breath too long, you pass out and your brain takes over. Production of body heat, shivering, also thermoregulation. Communication, obviously this one's specialized for your, the little small hairs in our skin that stands up when we're scared, right? The, er the erector pili muscles. Constriction of organs and vessels. So this is smooth muscle, this is smooth muscle. And contraction of the heart, that's cardiac muscle. So in terms of function of the muscular system, this is functions of all three types of muscles. Now we're gonna primarily talk about skeletal muscles first. Then in chapter 20 next semester, you will talk about cardiac muscles. So in terms of general properties of the muscle, muscles need to be able to be, to shorten with force. We call that contractility. Muscles need to be able to respond to a nervous stimuli. Whether that nervous stimuli is stretch, yeah, it's kind of loud out there, or it's your brain telling the muscles to work. It needs to respond somehow. Then, once, sorry, All right? One, then once you contract the muscle, you need to be able to stretch it, and sometimes stretching it beyond its normal resting length. Think of this as when people are really flexible, and they're able to even go beyond full extension. You've seen gymnasts somehow spread their legs completely apart, and they go beyond full extension. Usually with the gymnasts, when they go beyond full extension, they don't rip that muscle because they're so flexible. The reason why is because of this extensibility thing. All right, that elasticity. Once you've stretched the muscle, it re recoils and goes to its original length. All of these are factors for all muscles. Now, we've kind of talked about these three types of muscles previously. Skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Skeletal muscles, that's the predominant of what we'll talk about today, right? And for probably the next week, because it's pretty intense stuff, we're probably have to, we're probably gonna take a little, a little bit more breaks than normal, and then kind of talk about it Monday, right? Remember, make sure I have the dates right. Remember that we don't have class next Wednesday, and if you have class on Thursday, you don't have class Thursday either. I know it's kind of crazy, right, in the middle of semester. So we'll talk about this today and a little bit on Monday and for the like, first 40 minutes. Um, skeletal muscles are, responsible for movement, locomotion, facial expression, posture, 
respiratory movements, and other, body other types of body movements. Skeletal muscles are voluntary. That does not mean we can't get a reflex to occur. Reflexes are involuntary, but true motor contractions are voluntary conditions. Smooth muscles are different. They're usually involuntary, controlled by the endocrine system or the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is your sympathetic versus parasympathetic. You guys have heard of a fight, flight, rest, digest? That's these guys right here, right? So when we talk about fight or flight, that's your sympathetic nervous system. That's our, right here. Increases your heart rate, increases your respiratory rate, things like that. They get you ready for activity. Think about what happens when you exercise. Then parasympathetic is the, right, rest and digest. So there's those two. There's always a balance between that in our body. So when you're about to go to bed, you have more parasympathetic activity. When you are eating, you have more parasympathetic activity. When you're walking out to the car, that's more sympathetic activity, right? When you are exercising, that's sympathetic output. There's that balance between the two. Smooth muscles, some of the functions include, right, propelling urine, your bladder, your urethra contains lots of smooth muscle. Mixing food in the digestive tract. Your, anybody's ever eaten uh, intestines, chitlins, yeah. right? Yeah, so if you eat chitlins then, you're eating smooth muscle because that's what we see in the digestive tract. Even dilating and constricting your pupils, that's smooth muscle. In some occasions, they're autorhythmic. That means they can control by themselves. You can have some control, but for the most part, most of us can't control it. Can you control your heart rate? No, not voluntarily, right? Can you control, right, your digestive system? Meaning what? How many times when you guys were young, you sit next to somebody you like in middle school or high school, and then your stomach starts to grumble really loud, right? And you're like started getting really nervous about it because you're already nervous, and you're trying to you know, stop it from grumbling and there's no way you can stop it from grumbling, right? There's no real control of these smooth muscles. Now I said for most of us, right? We can't control your body heat, but there are some people that can, and we'll talk about that later on. Cardiac muscles are also autorhythmic and controlled involuntarily by the same systems that control smooth muscle, meaning the endocrine system and the autonomic motor systems, which is your sympathetic and parasympathetic. So again, the, we're gonna talk about this the most, this chapter. So again, let's talk about it in the way they look. When we look at this picture, you'll notice that skeletal muscles are very, very long tubes of muscle. Skeletal muscles are gonna have multinucleated cells. Each one of these really long cylindrical cells we can call a muscle fiber or a muscle cell. The book will kind of flip back and forth about calling it one versus the other, right? In one sentence, I call it a muscle cell. In another muscle, you know, paragraph, they'll call it a muscle fiber. They're the same things, right? So keep that in mind. Muscle cell, muscle fiber are used interchangeably. And then take a look at the, some of the differences between skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Again, those are like the questions I like to ask on the written part of the test. So let's talk about this muscle structure. And what I like to do normally is start off by comparing a normal cell with a skeletal muscle cell. Right? In a normal cell, you have nucleus. Well, in a skeletal muscle cell, you have nuclei and lots of them. It's not just one nuclei. There's gonna be many, many nuclei, right? And the reason why is because they develop from many cells that fuse together. Each of those many cells contain one nucleus. When they fuse, 
you can have multinucleated skeletal muscle fiber. So this is one skeletal muscle fiber. This is another one that's a completely different skeletal muscle fiber. Then you have another one over here and another one over here. Right? The whole purpose of a skeletal muscle fiber is to contract with strength. So when you contract with strength, you need to have a lot of proteins inside of them so then you can maximize the number of interactions between the proteins and you have a stronger contraction. They tend to be smaller in diameter in small muscles and larger in diameter in large muscles. Meaning that when we look at the skeletal muscle in your thigh, right, your quadriceps muscles, they're big muscles. They're the strongest muscles that we have in our body, your quadriceps. When we look at those under the microscope, those individual muscle fibers are thicker. Makes sense, right? They need more strength because they carry your body weight when you walk. So you want each muscle cell to have a lot of protein and each muscle cell to be a little bit thicker and longer compared to, if you imagine, your fingers. Your fingers, you don't need to support your body weight. So the muscles here that allows you to move your thumb a certain way, they don't need to be as strong because they don't need to be as strong. Each individual muscle fiber I look at are gonna be much thinner and much shorter. And we're gonna see, that also means that you have a little bit more control over it. Stride appearance due to light dark banding. So what else do we have in the skeletal muscle cell? Right, we have multinucleated cell. In a normal cell, we have the plasma membrane made out of phospholipids and lots of proteins here. In the skeletal muscle cell, I want you to get used to seeing this word Sark. Anything with Sark has to do with a muscle cell. So the first one is the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma is the muscle cell's plasma membrane. Now this plasma membrane right here, right, is going to be slightly different. The plasma membrane covers the entire muscle fiber, but there are parts of the muscle membrane right here that gets pushed deep inside. I want you to think about what happens when you are, let's say, making bread or making cookies. You have this big thing of dough, right? And what happens if you push your finger into the big thing of dough? Well, if you push your finger in, you're pushing all that dough material from the outside inwards. That's what's happening here. So the skeletal muscle membrane, sarcolemma, has areas where we push that membrane internally. As we push that membrane internally, you see these little tubes that go inside the cell. Those tubes are gonna be very important in helping a muscle contract. Those tubes are called transverse tubules. And we'll talk about what they do in just a minute. What else do we see? So it's our regular, a normal typical cell has plasma membrane, muscle cell, we call it the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma here is optimized so then we can have a spread of nerve impulse, right? So we can spread an action potential throughout the muscle cell. What else do we see? In a normal cell, we see a cytoplasm. Same thing in a muscle fiber. The cytoplasm is called a sarcoplasm in a muscle fiber, All right? Now, the sarcoplasm is kind of different compared to another cell. In a typical cell, you have all the organelles, right? We will see those organelles as well in a skeletal muscle cell. But some of the organelles are slightly different, mutated in a way, right? It's just change. Now, what else do we see in the sarcoplasm? The sarcoplasm in a muscle fiber are filled with these threads. Each thread is called a myofibril. So here's one myofibril thread, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one. The myofibril threads fill up the interior of the muscle cell. There's so many of them that even the nucleus gets pushed to the sides. See that? So when you look at this picture, look at where the nuclei are. The nuclei are all on the periphery. There's nothing in the middle, right? 
Why? Because you have so many of these myofibrils that you push everything to the sides. Now, what else do we see? The sarcoplasm contains a red colored pigment called myoglobin, right? Myoglobin is an oxygen binding protein. So when you see something, you go to Sendix and you look at red meat. Why is red meat red? Red meat is red. It's gonna be gross, guys, so I'm just gonna warn you. All right, when you're looking at red meat like a steak, understand it's the skeletal muscle of that animal, right? So as you're eating the skeletal muscle of the animal, in terms of beef, it looks really red. Why does it look red? It's because their skeletal muscles are like ours. There's a lot of myoglobin in that muscle. That myoglobin allows it to store oxygen, so then it can have contractions quickly. So that myoglobin is what gives that red coloration. Red colored oxygen binding protein found in the sarcoplasm. What else do we see in the sarcoplasm? This, these two are important. All right, the sarcoplasm contains a large amount of glycogen for energy production, myoglobin for oxygen production, and at rest, very low calcium. Again, if something's highlighted and underlined, you're gonna see it on the test in some way. All right, so we see in the sarcoplasm here, glycogen, you see myoglobin, and at rest, very, very low levels of calcium virtually no calcium. That's gonna be important coming up, right? So what else do we see? Remember when we talked about the invaginations right here? Think again, right? What are we doing with these transverse tubules? We're pushing the plasma membrane internally. As we push the plasma membrane internally, what happens if you push it and then move your finger out? Well, now there's a hollow tube Right? That connects your plasma membrane, and then it goes all the way inside the cell. That's gonna be important. That's gonna be the big key in how we contract the muscle. It's going to link how we cause the muscle to, at first, electrically stimulate, and then mechanically contract. So we're gonna talk about that coming up, right? So we have these transverse tubules that I'm mentioning, that's the finger-like invaginations of the plasma membrane. Those transverse tubules allow action potentials, right? You, what most people call a nerve impulse. Allows action potentials to quickly spread internally inside the muscle and then spread throughout the rest of the muscle cell. If we were to remove, so probably easier sometimes to imagine what happens if we don't have it, right? Because it's sometimes hard to imagine what this thing does, right? Because we've never heard of it before. So what would happen if we did not have transverse tubules? What would happen if I just cut them off right now? What would happen is this. I would still have an action potential on the plasma membrane, but without the, the action potential going deep into the cell, I would not have the actual contraction, right? The transverse tubules allows for the muscle cell to physically shorten when you need the muscle cell to contract. We talk about how in just a few minutes. So the T-tubules, the sarcoplasm. Now the T-tubules right here also surround something we call the sarcoplasmic reticulum the way that the skeletal muscle cell is ordered and the way that it's ordered is different than in a typical cell. Skeletal muscle cells can be very long, right? Because they're long, they're broken up into regions right here. Here's one region, here's another one, right? That region is called, right? And I should have a picture of it right here. That region, right, is called a sarcomere, repeating units or repeating regions found inside the muscle cell. So here's one sarcomere 
one sarcomere here, and then here's the start of a second sarcomere. In other words, when you have this really long muscle cell, we split up into different units. Each unit is called a sarcomere. Each unit of a sarcomere has one transverse tubule on each end, and then what looks like a web-like casing covering the myofibrils. Again, the myofibrils are the proteins that will allow us to contract. The more myofibrils, the more proteins, the stronger the contraction will be. So here, this cell has one myofibril, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight myofibrils. When it contracts, well, all, you know, eight of them on this side will contract. So it's a pretty strong contraction then. There's additive strength. Now what else do we see in terms of these myofibrils? Each myofibril is surrounded by modified endoplasmic reticulum we call the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum right here surrounds each myofibril. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and this is what's important about it, stores calcium at rest. In other words, I just mentioned that inside the cell, very low calcium at rest. Where's all that calcium then? Right? All of the calcium is stored in this web-like sarcoplasmic reticulum. Right? And when we're going to need that muscle to contract, we're going to release that calcium. Right? So calcium is going to be the signal for the muscle to contract. When it doesn't contract and you want it relaxed, it's all stored in this web-like sarcoplasmic reticulum. When you want the muscle to contract, there's a signal that causes the calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. With the release of calcium, then the muscle can shorten. Now keep in mind though, right? In order for a muscle contraction to occur, we need both an electrical and then a mechanical contraction. So when we're looking at this, in order for a muscle cell to contract, you need one, an electrical depolarization. We're not gonna use the word nerve impulse much, but this is a nerve impulse. So you need a nerve impulse. But you also need to have a second part right here, which is the mechanical contraction. So this is the actually shortening of the muscle. Due to actions of, I'm just gonna write the proteins, actin and myosin, right? But we're gonna see, you need two parts for muscle contraction. The first part, you need to stimulate it electrically. The second part is, once we stimulate it electrically, then it needs to mechanically shorten. What happens if you can't stimulate it electrically? In other words, what happens if I have a problem with a pinched nerve, right? And I can't send that impulse to the muscle. Well, the muscle doesn't contract, right? That's why when you have a pinched nerve, the muscle doesn't contract. And you have weakness as one of the signs with a pinched nerve. So if we don't have this, we can't have this, right? If we can't, even if we do have electrical depolarization, right, we need a functional muscle cell. In other words, what happens if we don't have a pinched nerve, right? We can get the nerve impulse in, but your muscle is ripped, right? you have some kind of rip of the muscle. And if you rip the muscle, yeah, you can have a nerve impulse there, but the muscle can't contract because there's damage. You need both parts to be functionally active, to have a true muscle contraction for intended muscle movements. Now, we're gonna see. There's a, something that links the nerve impulse and then causes the mechanical contraction, and that thing is calcium. Calcium is incredibly important. 
for this. It is what links, is what causes the mechanical contraction. The electrical depolarization, right? The only reason why we have that electrical discharge is to eventually release calcium. That's it, right? So the sole purpose of that nerve impulse in your muscle is to somehow release calcium. Then the calcium starts step two, the mechanical contraction. What makes this chapter hard is we're gonna talk about action potentials and muscle contraction all in one chapter. That's why I want us to talk about it now. I want you guys to kind of read about it over the weekend, right? So then we can discuss it in a little bit more detail Monday. Again, where do we store that calcium? Keep in mind, all the time when you're reading this, inside the cell, low calcium, right? In the sarcoplasm. Why is it low? Because all the calcium that should be in the sarcoplasm is now stored away in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The myofibrils right here are made out of primarily two smaller proteins. So these myofibrils are different combinations of proteins. When we look at the proteins in the myofibril, there's two very important contractile proteins. There's a thick and thin filaments, right? And these are the contractile proteins that allows the muscle to mechanically shorten. Sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium in a relaxed muscle. We store it in these end areas right next to the transverse tubule. The end areas are called the terminal cisterns, right? That's where we store the calcium. And what we're gonna see is this. When we want a muscle contraction, what do you need? An electrical depolarization first. You need some kind of nerve impulse. The nerve impulse is then gonna go through the, scalp, the whole sarcolemma, skeletal muscle membrane. As it goes through the plasma membrane, well, we have tiny invaginations in the plasma membrane, right? Those T-tubules. And the action potential goes down the T-tubules. As it does that, that's the trigger for calcium release, right? We need calcium release. How do we release it then? We release it by that nerve action potential. That's why I write number one to number two right there, right? And calcium causing number two, right? So, question. Oh, okay. So when we look at the, <laughs> the sarcomere right here, again, what is a sarcomere? A sarcomere is a repeating unit found inside a scalpel muscle. So when you have a very long skeletal muscle cell, you can see hundreds of different sarcomeres, right? Those hundreds of different sarcomeres will contract in synchrony. It doesn't contract all at once, right? There's a little bit lag between this contraction, and that's gonna be very important coming up. So when we look at a sarcomere, that's a repeating unit found inside the skeletal muscle cell, and what we're gonna see is that it's divided up into Z disc on each side, and then, and probably better see it this way, right? So here's one sarcomere, here's another sarcomere, here's another one. So this is one cell right here, right? This is one cell right here. And the cell has these repeating sarcomeres throughout the length. When we look at each sarcomere, you see a dark, Light, dark, light, dark, light banding. That's the striations, right? So the striations right here are, here's a light, here's a dark. Here's a light, here's a dark band, right? The dark bands are what we call the anistrophic regions. Well, let me see what that is, right? Or A bands. So the A bands, Dark bands are the A bands. It contains a combination of thick and thin filaments. The light, lighter bands only contain thin filaments. So when you look at this, right? So here's this darker coloration of the striations. You see it right here as well. We call that the A band right here. 
Well, the A band is a combination of the thicker protein and the thinner protein. So if you have both proteins and you're looking at a microscope, what happens? Well, light comes from underneath in a microscope, right? So as the light hits your skeletal muscle slide, the thicker something is, the less light goes through. It appears darker then, right? So this area that's dark usually means that you have more proteins there. It makes sense then this area that's dark has a combination of the thick filament and the thin filament. The lighter area right here only has thin filaments. Thin filaments are thin. So because they're thin, light goes right through them. And as it goes right through, it looks much brighter. Right? Again, the eye bands, eye as in light, kind of silly, but that's how you can tell which one is which. What do I mean? Well, you can't spell light without an I. You can't spell dark without an A, right? That's how you can tell which one's which. The I band is lighter. The A band is the darker. Now let's talk about these filaments coming up. All right, let's take a look right here. And at first I didn't like this picture. I mean, it's purple and green. So what we're gonna see is that they actually color code this throughout the rest of the chapter with purple and green. So let's take a look at one sarcomere and what are the proteins found in that sarcomere? First thing, all of the proteins, especially the light or the thin filaments, they're anchored to a Z-disc. The Z-disc is the anchoring area of a sarcomere. It allows us to anchor the light bands or the thin filaments. And what we're gonna see is when a muscle contracts. So what happens if I contract my bicep muscle? When I contract it, it's gonna shorten. As it shortens, it pulls on my forearm. So all muscles shorten when they contract. How do we get the muscle to shorten? We're gonna talk about the interaction between these two proteins. That's how we get it to shorten, right? What happens? You have these light, thin filaments anchored to the Z-disc right here. Then you have thick filaments over here, and the thick filaments have head regions that sticks up. And what we're gonna see is when we contract the muscle, the thick filament is gonna reach and pull actin, the thin filament, to the middle. On each side right here. So on this side, all of the myosin, all of the thick filament, is gonna reach up, make contact with the thin filament, and then pull it to the middle. So everything on this side gets pulled to the middle. The Z-disc gets pulled towards the middle then. Everything on this side gets pulled towards the middle. So then the thin filaments gets pulled to the middle, and what goes with it? The Z-disc, right? So what happens? If I keep pulling everything towards the middle, I'm shortening it, aren't I? And that's exactly what happens in a muscle contraction. It is the myosin head right here that pulls the thin filament, which is actin, to the middle. And since actin is connected to the Z-disc, the Z-disc goes with it. As myosin pulls actin on this side, it pulls it towards the middle. As you pull the myosin, or the actin towards the middle, the Z-disc goes with it. So before, that sarcomere, that span between one Z-disc to the next Z-disc. At rest, it's really long. When we want a muscle to contract, everything gets pushed towards the middle, shortening it. That's a muscle contraction. That's all it right there, is that you are going to pull the Z-disc towards the middle by pulling the thin filament towards the middle. By pulling both towards the middle, you shorten that space. As you shorten that space, you shorten the muscle, allowing the muscle then to contract, right? Now, in terms of these proteins, what we're gonna talk about with these proteins is simple. 
看了什么